<clears throat> so I made a mistake on last video here, last last class. I stopped right here. And I even labeled, I think, revenue at break even. But this is a margin of safety question. Margin of safety is how, how safe are we, meaning away from break even? How far are we from break even? So I have to find the difference between our current revenue and the revenue at break even. So I said this is the right answer on the test question we had. Uh, that this is the, the, but it's not. If it were asking for what revenue do we have at break even, this would be the right answer. But it was asking for margin of safety, which means that our, our actual revenue of 500,000 puts us at a margin of safety of 187.5 thousand, which is that revenue we have minus the revenue at break even. So we have this 187.5 margin where we could theoretically lose revenue and still not start defaulting on fixed costs, start having to call up our, our people we owe bills to and say, hey, can you yeah, yeah, give us a couple more months or whatever, start, start the cycle, uh, the, the downward cycle of, of going out of business. <clears throat> And so this is the right answer. We were right about the degree of operating leverage. So that question, it had an option that had 3125 as, as the margin of safety and 1875 as the margin of safety. And then the degree of operating leverage is either, I think, 0.667, something under 1, and then another option which was over 1. And we knew just by, by dint of what degree of operating leverage is, is it has to be over 1 because it's contribution margin over profit, and profit is contribution margin minus fixed cost. So by, by mathematical sense, it has to be that it's a it's a number one or greater, <clears throat> unless you don't have, have negative fixed costs, which you, you don't. So yeah, this 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 is the right answer here. Uh, I didn't realize until after I submitted the, the quiz, and it, it said, oh, you only got one of those questions that you submitted right, and I looked back and, and realized this one was wrong, because I got had by my own, I got, got what did I say? I was got by my own, uh, my own distractor here. Uh, yeah, got by my own distractor. All right, so that was that was uh, Monday's class. I'll go ahead and close this one now. I've opened a new one for Tuesday's, Wednesday's class, or excuse me, live in the past, because we're going to keep talking about Chapter 3 and Chapter 4, because those homeworks are due this, this Friday, right here. <clears throat> uh, but we're also going to make sure that we catch up and start talking about Chapter 5. We will set aside time to start talking about Chapter 5. Maybe go over some 5-1 uh, quiz questions because that's that's coming up uh, due February 2nd, right here. So that's that hopefully is the last delay we have. Between today and next Monday and Wednesday, hopefully we will be able to cover materials for 5-1 and 5-2 and be caught up so that we are, we're nice and, and chugging along when we get into the first half of process costing and then towards the midterm. Now, as far as the midterm goes, uh, these... I'm in, I'm in the online... No. I believe I, I can delete this uh, from the in-person class here. <clears throat> but as far as the midterm and review quiz and, and, and this, this, this week, module seven, and this week, module eight. As far as these two are concerned, so let's jump to the schedule here. I'm gonna make the midterm available the Friday before this week, right here. So these kind of two weeks are your midterm week. You're available to, to have them. Uh, I'm gonna make them available the Friday before this. At least the midterm will be available the Friday before. Midterm exam review might be available even before that. So let's see, we've got talking about the, the week of the 20th here. 20th because it's President's Day, the 19th. So this week right here and this week right here. I'll make it available by, by the 16th here, Friday. Uh, in part because, you know, people like to do these over the weekend sometimes. If you've got a lot of things going on during the week. And if you're given two weeks and you do them over the weekends, that really is one weekend. If, if I just make it available Monday here and it stops being available on the 1st. Friday of that week. So you only have this one weekend and you got two attempts. So if you are somebody who's managing work or other responsibilities, family responsibility, whatever, and you really rely on weekends to do some of this work that's outside of class, I want to give you the full two weekends. So I'll make it available by this, this Friday here. Just so, so you know, but it will be due by the end of the Friday, the second week here. Okay. So these full two weeks from 16th to the 1st of, of March, 16th February to 1st of March. That's when the midterm will be we'll be going. That's that's a ways down the road here. We're still we're still right here. Oh, excuse me, right here. 
24th, second day of this week right here. So we're going to catch up, finish up chapter four and chapter three and hit hard our chapter chapter five information. So let's talk about chapter four and chapter three. And let's go through a question or two that are department level job order costing questions because I leaned on those in this test bank. They give me a double whammy. They help me test your understanding of department level operating, I mean, department level overhead in a job, department level job order costing system. And they give you additional reps of all the normal PDOH things and all the normal application things. And, and you get, you get extra review for all the other things that are, you're also getting, getting tested on when you're doing the, the company wide overhead rate questions. So let's go down to one of these questions. Okay. So here we have, uh, this, this department level job order costing question. So I know it's that I can, I can, um, I can start to reference the right files in my brain. I read the questions to them. What is the firm's predetermined? Yes. No. Good question. So uh, I've said that we're going to have the class this week, but I mean that doesn't supersede the university holiday. I can't. I can't make you come in if I, even if I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so review at home instead of celebrating, uh, just just for my sake. Um, but no, no class that day. Good question. Yeah, thanks. All right, so yeah, I can read the question stem. What is the firm's predetermined overhead rate for the Jack department? For Jack department. Okay, so there are two departments here. I, I can, again, I can reference the right files in my brain. Okay, departmental overhead rates, predetermined overhead rate. That sounds like job order costing. So for example, if I'm on midterm and I've got questions about CVP, I've got questions about job order costing, I've got questions about ABC, I've got questions about process costing. This helps me zero in and say, okay, this particular file in my brain or this part of my one page of notes, this, that's where I'm probably referencing. And I can read through the, the fact pattern here. So Jonathan Depp Incorporated uses departmental job order costing with multiple rates, one rate per department. The firm's two departments, so we have two departments and each one has a rate, uses the following cost driver. So Captain Department uses direct labor hours as, as its cost driver for overhead. Jack Department uses machine hours for its cost driver for overhead. Uh, those are bolded and italicized because there are different versions of this question that have different uh, different inputs here. Maybe they're, they're switched. But this version has DLH for Captain Department and MH for Jack Department. And we have the following budgeted numbers. Okay, well, remember, it's in the name that it's predetermined. So we need to use the budgeted numbers in case I'm trying to tempt you out here with using actual numbers. We need to use budgeted numbers to come up with our, our overhead rates. So Captain Department has this data. Jack Department has this data. So I've given you a budgeted overhead and I've given you two budgeted cost driver figures and I'm simply asking for a rate. All right, well, we can, we can remember. We can remember our, our chapter four, one of our two equations in this chapter, not counting me reiterating the pi equation right here. Okay, well, PDOH rate means budgeted overhead over budgeted cost driver. Now, do I restate that down here with departmental in that section here? Let's see, let's see, let's see. No, I don't. You can put, if you want, on your notes or whatever to remind yourself if you have a problem with this, departmental, you can put departmental overhead rate, PDOH rate. So just put DEPT here equals DEPT, departmental budgeted overhead over DEPT, departmental budgeted cost driver. Because that's how we're going to apply it. So we're looking for the Jack Department PDOH. We're going to take this numerator right here, budgeted overhead costs. That matches budgeted overhead for that department over one of these two. What's Jack Department's cost driver? Machine hours. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to put it over the 5,000 machine hours. Right, let's get our... our Unlock. So this is our DPT, PDOH rate problem. We have 65,000. Check department, budget overhead costs. We have, I think it was 5,000. Now 5,000 is our budgeted machine hours. The Jack department, simply divide them. Oh, look, nice. Jack department overhead, oh, PDOH rate predetermined overhead rate. And that's as far as this question is asking you to go. Not too bad. Are there ways to mess it up? Yes. 
You could try to sum. The two, and then divide that by the five thousand. We get eighteen. Oh, that's one of the one of the distractors. You could try to sum the machine hours. We'll just do that, and we'll say equals this divided by sum of the five thousand. From Jack Department, and we're gonna. Oh, oh! I should, I should add these, these machine hours in too, which is incorrect. Don't do that. So we could get that number wrong that way. I didn't quite put that as one of the distractors, but that's one way you could do it. We could do both. Let's try and get all summed up, divided by five thousand, five thousand plus twenty-five hundred. Oh, that is one of the distractors. Good, twelve, right there. And I don't remember what that problem is, but you could, you could. Maybe maybe that's um, if you took it under, you divided it by direct labor hours for some reason. <clears throat> so ways to mess this up, not too bad, but uh, still still can be possible to to have a mistake there. Now this is a little more comprehensive. A few more steps in this one. I give you the PDOH rates for each department, but now I'm asking you to apply them to order LM five zero. That's bolded and italicized because sometimes I change. There's some versions of the question that have different order numbers you're, you're figuring, and that changes some of the facts here, I believe. And sometimes I ask you for total cost, sometimes probably overhead cost, maybe sometimes for unit cost for the order. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to track this through our two departments and its consumption of overhead, and it looks like we're looking for total cost. We also want to care. We also care about the direct costs. This this order incurred some direct costs, and it's going to be applied some overhead based on Department A's consumption of either direct labor hours or machine hours, and Department B consumption of direct labor hours or machine hours. I said that kind of funky. It's not that Department A and Department B are consuming that. It's that this order consumes that from Department A. In Department A, it uses up, we're talking about Department A, it uses direct labor hours. So we care about this 40 right here. What we're saying is order LM50, used 40 direct labor hours in Department A, caused 40 direct labor hours to be, to be expended in Department A <clears throat> from their staff. And so it needs to be charged 50 bucks per direct labor hour. So let's, let's, let's sort this out. Let's go ahead and, oh, wrong one. Let's start writing this down. So this is department total cost problem. Department job order costing, total cost problem. So LM50, that's our order. Department A, department. We have 40 direct labor hours. Uh, 50 is our PDOH. Well, $50 per DLH is Department A's PDOH, right? So that's the Department A allocation of overhead to order LM50. $2,000. Well, Department B over here uses, looks like machine hours. So we're going to look at how many machine hours were incurred for department, I was highly wrong. For department B, by department B, to service LM50. So it's 20. Oh, wrong screen. 20. That's our machine hours. I'll put even the name. It's department A's direct labor incurred. Department B machine hours incurred. And we have 72.50 is our rate. That is per machine hour, that's Department B's PDOH rate. Multiply those two. Great. That's Department B's allocation of overhead to L order LM50. 
Add those together. That's our total overhead, just overhead, of LM50. Now, that's not a perfect number. It's not the perfect amount of responsibility LM50 had of overhead costs that we incurred in our firm. But given the assumptions we're making, which are relatively reasonable, which are going to get a little more accurate than just ran randomly assigning an overhead, this is our best guess of how much overhead really LM50 is responsible for, how much overhead cost. And we also have this to deal with, some direct costs, because it is asking total cost. So we have our direct costs. This is direct materials and direct labor. 10,000 and 20,000. So if we sum these three, our direct materials, our direct labor, the direct costs there, plus the overhead that's been allocated, we should get our total cost of LM50. All right. I'm being real poetic and like not capitalizing some things in here. So hope that doesn't offend you. All right. That's why the answer choice is good. Let's try it out. We, we selected this one. Okay. So yeah, I get to put you through the paces of allocating overhead twice with this kind of problem. In addition to having you discern, well, which, which numbers do I use to, to charge these rates out to? And do I include, again, I get to put you through the paces of, is it asking for total cost? Do I include the direct cost? <clears throat> we end up spending so much. Here's, here's the thing. There's a small percentage, at least 15% of the, the class uh, every, every year that I go over job order costing that, that focuses on the overhead so much that they forget that it's not the only cost to the job. It's just going to consume 75% of your time answering the questions about the cost for the job because it involves a lot of estimation and PDOH rates and allocating. Whereas the direct costs, they tend to be ones we can, we can track pretty easily. You can track where all your materials went to, to this, or they went to this product unit, this, this product unit, and direct labor hours. Uh, a good number of you, if you are accounting majors, are intending to become direct labor hours. That's your intention. That's, that's what billable hour, hours means for a public accounting firm. You are the direct labor. Uh, they're tracking your hours because they need to charge directly. You're not, you're not in, in this chunk right here of overhead where we don't know where, which, which job it went to. No, no, no. We know exactly which hours were spent and we're going to bill that to the, the client. <clears throat> the, the, we just spend a lot of time muddling around with overhead because it's a, a trickier problem and we need to, to do some thinking about it and, and organization so that we get, get ourselves nice and, and as accurate as we can. But don't forget that when we're talking about the total cost, it includes the direct cost. That's kind of a tangent I'm going on, and I'm done with that tangent. All right, any other job order costing, a chapter four job order costing questions that you've got a burning desire to go over before Friday? A style of question? This one right here? Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> All right. So let's see. We're looking for overhead cost. So I know I can see up with the fact patterns department. So job, job order overhead cost question here. It's an open answer too. So that's, that makes it extra fun. What is the job absidies overhead cost? All right, a firm uses job order costing with department level overhead rates. So we've got department one and department two. I was real creative. I stopped doing A and B and I did one and two just to spice it up. Uh, here are our rates. The first rate is by batch. Second rate is by direct labor hours. All right, job ABCDE or ABCDE if you want, incurred the following cost drivers. Department one, 105 batches, 335 direct labor hours. Department two, 120 batches, 284 labor, direct labor hours. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy over our facts up here. That's a little bit of a typo. I put hours instead of hour. I'll remind myself about that later. Put a little. I don't spend too much time on that. <clears throat> All right. 
And so now what I need to do is I need to say, well, which, which of these four numbers do I use? I'm going to multiply this by something, but I can't multiply by all four. It's, it's one of these four. So department one, it's per batch. So I'm going to take department one's batches. So job absentee went through department one, required 105 batches. I don't know what that, that means. Maybe department one involves kilns, and they have to go through a certain number of batches through the kiln. Maybe it's, it involves uh, paint, and they have to go through a paint, the, the paint station in batches. And depending on the nature of the job, I, have, I can do it in more batches or fewer batches. Regardless, they consumed a certain number of batches in department one. So I'm going to multiply that by the 105. That's department one batches right there and that should be department one overhead allocation to absidy all right and i can ignore direct labor hours in terms of just overhead cost it, it doesn't matter my cost driver is this alone it's my co-pilot here this forget about it I toss it out the door Department two here, we flip flop because it's direct labor hour cost driver here. So just we're only paying attention to over here to the 284 direct labor hours. That's department two DLH. I'm going to multiply that by the 1172 and that's department two uh, overhead allocation to our job in question. We should be able to sum these. Google really thinks it knows what I'm trying to sum every time I, I do this, and, and only 20% of the time is it right. That should be our total overhead cost for ABCD job. Let me double check that. 24 DLH. Okay, 629, 105. That should be right. Okay, okay, take it easy. Does that make sense? Is that good? Okay. Chapter four requests. Other ones? Are there any questions about like the is this the account of the work in progress and things like that? Ah. I know there are. Uh are there on this quiz, I guess, is the, the question we're looking for, right? This this uh, quiz attempt. So we have a fresh kitty. That's a question. We'll, we'll keep that little pin in there. Maybe we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Uh, we also have we close overhead to, to cogs. What's the cogs? We can do a couple of these. We can do all three of these if we want. Does that, that work? We didn't just spend a lot of time on that on Monday. Uh, I don't think, did we do a, a question on that on Monday? I, I think I talked about it. Okay, okay. Well, good. Let's go over the questions because, you know, getting into the details of how exactly you apply this in, in question form is important. An important, important bridge between, well, the professor yammered about it over here and to the point of I'm able to do it over here. So let's get, let's get you from one to one, <clears throat> one to the other. All right. So we know uh, it's asking in the end of a, for a journal entry that can be made on October 10th. All right. So we've got different journal entries here. Looks like they vary based on entirely. It's all 6750. We know 6750 is the right, the right number. We're just, I'm just testing on whether you know which, which accounts it's going to. Okay, good. So let's look at the fact, fact pattern here. Fresh Kitty manufactures custom cat playgrounds and enclosures. The firm uses job order costing with machine hours as a, the cost driver. The firm's PDOH rate is 450 per machine hour. Great. So far, so good. On October 10th, a job, some job, I don't know, some name, called the meow job if you want. A job incurs 15 machine hours and $6,000 in overhead costs are incurred. All right, so the job is incurring the cost driver, which will trigger an allocation event of $450 per machine hour consumed, which is 450 times 15, which let's just double check, 99% sure that is going to be, uh, this is fresh, fresh kitty journal entry question. <clears throat> We have 450 is our PDOH rate, machine hours, and 15 is our machine hours consumed. You multiply those out. 6750 is our overhead allocated to that job. And I also said $6,000 of overhead costs are incurred. 
So that's about actual overhead costs. So I don't know what they do. What do they do? They, they have machinery that put, helps put together these playgrounds and enclosures, perhaps, which is why they use machine hours. And they had to repair a machine, and it cost $6,000. That's not necessarily connected to that job that went through. It's not like that job caused the machine to break and need repairs. No, many jobs went through the machine, and over time, the wear and tear has caused the machine to break and need repairs. So that's why we set up the overhead control account. Uh, I'll do it on the thing here for reference. So I set up the overhead control account the way we do. We had all fancy, just for fun. At least this one time. Okay, come on. We apply actual overhead costs here. So that $6,000 would be over here. We're debiting to overhead control $6,000 for the, somewhere we're doing that, uh, for the overhead costs incurred. But we're allocating out of the other side. And that would be the 650, 6750, excuse me, up here. So if this is the only thing that happens this entire period, the balance will be a 750 credit balance for this overhead control account. <clears throat> And so we'll have over-applied 750. It's probably not the only thing. We're just isolating one day, and I'm asking for a journal entry that could be here. So since I'm asking for sure about the 6750, it's probably going to be a credit to overhead control for 6750. So I, I think this is a possible one, and this is a possible one. All right, well, what's the other account we're going to be doing, we're going to be using here? It's work in process. So I'm going to grab all this for the lovely formatting I did, so I don't have to redo it. And working process is, a, is an inventory account. It's on the balance sheet. And so as we incur costs, we debit the work in process, because it, it costs us to do the work for this work in process. And it's going to add up in the end to the cost of that finished good in inventory, which once it's sold becomes the cost of the good sold, which hits the income statement. So we're tracking it, kind of accumulating costs in work in process. One of those costs is overhead, and how much overhead does it does this job incur? So it hits debit over here. It's that allocated amount right here. It's 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 divorced and separated a little bit from, uh, uh, literally from, what actually happened with overhead. We're we're not directly taking overhead costs and putting them into the working process. No, it goes to the filter of well, what got allocated based on our our PDOH rate and the cost driver consumed to apply the PDOH rate. I feel like there's a a light flashing in the room a lot. Is that bothering anybody over there? Not so much. Okay, well, if it does, I, I could send an email, I guess. That's the best I can do. They would frown on me trying to go up there and fix it myself, I think. So uh, I'm seeing us needing to do a debit to work in process for this overhead allocation. I think this is the right answer here. Does that make the logic there make sense? I think I've gotten through all the steps in what I said, but it's kind of been piecemeal. I'm going to try one more 20 seconds to real quick wrap it up. We know for sure we incurred 15 machine hours, which means there was an allocation event, $450 per machine hour, 6750. So we're going to credit overhead control and assign the job, which is a, a work in process, a debit of that amount. <clears throat> that's that period. I mean, we could talk about the rest of the process and everything else, but for this question, that's it. Yep, exactly, yes. The allocated is always on the credit side. Actual overhead costs are always on the debit side of overhead control. Again, I, I repeat one more time one thing I said really quickly when I first introduced this. Sometimes it's called just overhead account. Sometimes it's called overhead control. Sometimes it's called manufacturing overhead. Sometimes it's called manufacturing overhead control. I don't think anybody just calls it control, but I guess theoretically you could just call it the control account. People have different names for this, but it, it operates the same way. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about what that journal entry would look like. So all the answers are like 6,000? Yeah. yeah. So there's another entry that can be made this day because we've incurred $6,000 of, of cost, or another word for cost is expense. You're more familiar with that word. Uh, what is the difference between cost and expense? That's, that's a very 
sounds very philosophical, but really we talk about costs in this class, talk about expense and financial accounting. That's basically the idea. Let me put a pin in that and get to the question as well. So we know there's an expense of $6,000 or a cost of $6,000. In this case, the two overlap perfectly. In that case, we're, we're debiting the actual cost to overhead control and we're going to credit somewhere. So it's going to be this one or this one. It's definitely not this one. We wouldn't be crediting overhead control. It would be 6000 instead of 6750 We wouldn't debit. Wait. Yeah, we wouldn't debit overhead control and then credit WIP $6,000. It doesn't really make much sense. We made a repair for the machine, so therefore we're going to decrease the, the cost of our inventory, the value of the inventory, and how much money we put into the... No, it doesn't really make sense. <clears throat> Instead, it more makes sense that we're, we likely have a payable to whoever it is that gave us that service. We brought a maintenance person in to, do the ser to, to fix the machine, so we have $6,000 accounts payable to that person. So that's much, that would be the answer for that one. I hope not, because both of those, technically speaking, here it says which one could be made. Uh, those both could be made. So I'd have two correct answers if I made the question like that. I, I would, if you see that, let me know, because I messed up. Yeah, we're going to be debiting $6,000 to some sort of account, some sort of payable, uh, or directly to cash. You know, if we're paying it out of cash, that's, that's fine, uh, or, or some sort of a, uh, Wages payable or whatever. <clears throat> we, we got the six thousand dollars actual overhead cost incurred somewhere. <clears throat> All right. So more to the the, the point. I, I do every semester. I want to cover this at some point, but but I'll I'll filter in when I when I when it comes up. So a cost really is is anything that 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 is a sacrifice you're making, presumably to to forward the interest of the business. An expense is a sacrifice you're making to forward the interest of the business that is required to be recognized on financial statements. So cost is a bigger category, and expenses are a subcategory of cost. It's basically how this, this works in, in uh, definitionally. Because you have things like opportunity cost. Do not try to expense opportunity cost on the financial statements. You will go to jail. It's not a good idea, but it is a real cost. You go someplace, you can't go someplace else. It's a real opportunity cost. It's important for decision making. And like we're talking about this, this class is all about what do people have to do to make the best decisions, what do companies have to do to make the most profitable decisions. They want to Consider all the costs, only some of those, most of those, but still a smaller subsection of those compared to the overall world of costs, a smaller subsection of those are expenses that get recognized on, on the income statements or on the, on the income statement, on the financial statements in general. And so here we're talking about overlap. They're both, it's a cost and it's an expense, and we can use our logic from expenses to work on it. <clears throat> okay, we got that one. I said I was going to do all, all the ones we have here. So great. So this one is asking, let's see the questions in here. If the firm closes the overhead control account to COGS, so some versions of the questions probably say rateably and give you information to do it rateably. Uh, what is the credit to COGS in the entry that closes the overhead control account? Okay, Whew. So we have some entry, some journal entry, to close the overhead control account to cost of goods sold. Uh, it's going to be a credit to COGS, which means we have a debit balance and overhead control. We underapplied. We have more actual overhead costs. I'll face this way so I'm doing this. More actual overhead costs on the debit side than we had allocated or applied costs on the credit side. So we end up with a debit balance. No, I, I got it backwards in my head. Yeah, sorry. We, we, I did have it backwards. We overallocated. There we go. We overapplied. We have more over here on the left hand, the right hand side than we had actual costs. So we have a credit balance in overhead control. There we go. I got it right. Because then the entry is going to have a debit to overhead control to get it to zero and crediting over to COGS. All right. Got ourselves situated after going the wrong way first and then doing that meme of like the quick exit off the freeway. That's what we did. Back back to what's right. Uh, we got to figure out what that amount is. This is a very long, uh, convoluted way of asking how much did we overapply? That's really it. We overapplied a certain amount. How much did we overapply? Because we're closing it all out to COGS. It's the same, going to be the same number. That, that credit balance at the end at over control, at the bottom, is going to be the same amount that we debit so it gets to zero and then credit over to COGS. So let's look at this COGS journal entry question. Say over applied. 
So we budgeted 17093 in overhead. We actually incurred 18425. Okay, well, hey, we know that's the actual actual overhead cost. So that's gonna that's how much was was in the right hand side. Oh, the left hand side, the debit side. I got I usually say debits and credits, right? But I often say the wrong handedness. Maybe it's because I'm constantly flipping it around in my head. Because you're over there. And I'm yeah. uh, on the left hand side, the debit side, that's 18425. We have a predetermined overhead rate of 1178 uh, per direct labor hour, and we use 2004 direct labor hours. Are we going to use this number at all? I, I saw see some shaking heads, and that's right. We do not need that number. I already gave you the rate. The rate is what you would need this number for. You would need that in the numerator and then total budgeted direct labor hours in the denominator to get the rate. I gave you the rate. I'm so nice. 11.78 is our PDOH rate. We consumed a total of 2004. That is our, our um, total actual direct labor hours. So that means we would have allocated 2004 hours times $11.78 of overhead cost per direct labor hour. This is our total allocated overhead for the period. So now we have a difference between these two. And that is our right-hand side credit balance in overhead control. So the journal entry is going to debit overhead control by this amount to get it to zero. We have a credit balance here of that amount. And going to be crediting cost of goods sold that same amount. So that should be our answer here. It's going to yell at me because it's got the dollar sign. I need to check, make sure I'm not forgetting something. Actual overhead. That's the PDOH rate, direct labor hours. That's the actual consumed. It's multiplying the right numbers. It's tracking the right numbers. The allocated yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, I chose to do allocated minus actual because I, I know that I have to input a positive value. I just want to make it easier on myself. It's, it's, that's the instruction here. So I know this is bigger than that, so I'm just going to subtract this minus that, so I can get a positive value. So, uh, I know for this problem, like anything that's bolded or mm -hmm. um, a cost price would be changed. So if it was something other than cogs, would that like, affect? Mm -hmm. uh, it would. It would. Uh, the only other option is something that says something like this. So let's. we should just do this problem, honestly, because it's kind of the other version of it. Is that, is that all right? Does that answer the uh, follow-up on your question? Okay, so yeah, if it looks, if it were different, <clears throat> uh, yeah, this is basically the same question, but with with um, with a little bit of a change. The bolded part has changed. So if the corporation closes the overhead control account by prorating to WIP, finished goods, and COGS based on units, what is the credit to finished goods in the entry that closes the overhead control account? So the overhead control account is going to have an entry. Uh, I'll put it in the thing instead of on the board. Make it so you can reference it later. This is the Prorated overhead control problem. We'll call it that. So we're going to have an entry where we debit or credit overhead control, and then we do the opposite to whip finished goods and cost of goods sold. And we're asking specifically for this right here. I'm asking specifically for this right here. That's what I want. How much are we crediting to finished goods? Looks like we're crediting. So we must be debiting overhead control. So I want that number right there. <clears throat> so uh, is that the same formulation? Yeah. So we're going to have the same sort of over-applied scenario here. Our, our number here is going to over-apply, and we're going to have to debit overhead control to cancel that out to zero to close out the overhead control account. And we're crediting out that over application to work in process, finished goods, and cost of goods sold. 
So we applied, the, the theory is this, we applied overhead costs that we'd never actually incurred. And so what we need to do is, if we don't, if we don't send those credits to decrease the asset value or the expense value to whip finished goods and cost of goods sold, we're going to overstate it. We're going to overstate the cost and value of our inventory in WIC, in WIP and finished goods and overstate how much we actually spent in overhead and cost of goods sold. So we're crediting those balances to bring them down. All of them go up with the debit. The inventory accounts and the expense account of the cost of goods sold go up with the debit. They're going to go down with the credit because we over applied costs. We didn't actually incur all the, all the overhead costs we, we allocated out. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so let's, I'm going to grab this and update as we go. So we actually incurred, uh, uh, again, I know I have the rate, so I'm not going to worry about the budgeted amount. We actually incurred 16,574. Uh, we have a rate of 11.93. I said 11.78. We incurred 2,198 direct labor hours. And so our, our total allocated overhead is $26,222.14. We only actually incurred 16,005. So we over allocated almost $10,000 right here. That's the credit balance in overhead control. <clears throat> I'm going to grab this. Mm. Not that far. There. Okay, so we need to debit this amount to override control to zero it out to close the account as part of the accounting process, accounting cycle. <clears throat> We're going to be debiting not everything to one account. Instead, we have this extra paragraph here. So if I ask this question right here, I have to give you information by which you can prorate the, the amount. This 9648 is going to be prorated between these three. It's spread out between these three based on this basis of, looks like we have 301 units that pertain to WIP. 780 units that pertain to finished goods, and 1429 units that pertain to, to cost of goods sold. For a total, I think that's got it. Yep, we've got this time, of 2510 units. So what I want is I want this to equal the proportion, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it all the way out here, instead of embedding it in the cell, make it easier to see. So here's what I'm doing. I'm saying that 301 for WIP, 301 units that pertain to WIP, that equals 11.99, so about 12% of the overall units, this 2,500 2, units that we have that are, that are being accounted for. 12%, so it's going to get 12% of the cost. So that's what we're going to credit to WIP. Likewise, I'll just go down because I made it an absolute reference to 2510. Likewise, we have finished goods here, which is 31%. That 780 is 31% of the 2510. So it gets 31% of the 9,648 dollars. Right? We can copy that down to cost of goods sold. Whoop. What'd you do to me now? Here we go. We can copy that formula down. To cost of goods sold, and I ruined the formula. Whatever I did, undo that. Okay. And so we take that 9648 times the 57%, basically, that that, 140, that 1429 is of the 2510. So these three together equal the 9648.14. We've just spread it all out. And this right here is what we're looking for. It says we want the finished goods credit. That's, that should be the right answer for us. Let's see, what do we do? We, we, we answered one, two, three, four, five, six, six questions here. Awesome. Let's see, any surprises here? Well, that's, that looks right. 15 is six times 2.5. Yeah. So we got them. All right. I I want to I want to jump into chapter five. Uh, unless you've got a real 
pressing chapter three question you want to go over. Uh, well, even if you do, I think, I think we'll, we're going to have to put it on hold. You have to ask me about it on, on your own. We've had, we had longer time to go over chapter three than chapter four. So I, I don't think that's going to be the case that you're, you're pressing, uh, you have a pressing chapter three question before the due date. So let's go ahead and talk about chapter five here. All right. So I have, I think done a, a I think I've calibrated my critique of job order costing correctly. It's a very important tool to get us more accurate overhead allocation. But it's not like it's the actual responsible, the actual responsibility for overhead that, that the products or the product lines actually incur. So activity-based costing comes out of uh, Kaplan, a uh, professor over at Harvard uh, and, and, and uh, in the 80s. And so the basic idea is, well, we can make this more accurate by adding cost drivers. More so than departmental overhead, with departmental overhead rates, we still have these lines right here. We can't do this. Can't can't allocate any overhead that's correlated with like direct labor hours. From department two, based on the direct department one's direct labor hour uh, cost driver, can't allocate an overhead that's uh, correlated with machine hours in department one, based on department two's machine hours. We have these big walls that limit the ability of us to really maximize the explanatory power of our costing regime. <clears throat> it's it's very much what you would expect to come out of somebody who's statistically minded, or a, a, a zeitgeist of, of statistically minded, a kind of semi-academic uh, uh, thing. I'm not, not, uh, I hope I'm not sounding like I'm throwing shade at, at, at Dr. Kaplan. Activity-based costing is, is, is a significant improvement or a significant event in, in costing history here. <clears throat> but the point I'm trying to make is, is when I look at it, I, I think of, well, naturally. Uh, that's what happens with regressions. You know, you have a linear regression, which tries to say this predictor or these predictors are correlated with this predicted value. All these X's are correlated with this Y. And it's it, mathematically, if you add a predictor, by definition, it has to, at least by a small, 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 small fraction, increase the explanatory power of that regression in, in predicting Y. So if you drill down far enough, it will have a 0 0.00001 increase in explanatory power. So the idea of, well, what we do is add predictors, add predictors, and add what, what we would talk about in this class as cost drivers. Mm. I, I tried to make it a point to, to point out how we're talking about correlation. We're saying overhead costs, in job order costing, we're saying overhead costs are correlated with this cost driver that we can trace to product units. And so therefore, we're going to act as if it is, the, it is what's, what's representing the responsibility because it's somewhat correlated. Is it perfectly correlated? No, no, it's not. But it's correlated enough. So how do we improve that? Well, add more drivers that are correlated. And so between all these drivers that are correlated, we get a, a more precise image of what the real responsibility is for that product unit. And that's basically the idea of activity-based costing. <clears throat> all right, I, I'm going to skip over my examples up here, which are just, you know, they are, they are life-changing. But that's not what you came here for. Let's talk about activity-based costing. And this activity rate equation looks suspiciously like the job order costing equation of budgeted overhead over budgeted driver. We got this word activity in there. So it's the same thing in the end. It's what we're doing. <clears throat> Some differences. Let's go down here. So if you recall, you know what, let's pull it up. We had our rectangle of doom down here in chapter four, right here, and we'll get the where's it labeled. We have direct, direct costs, direct materials and direct labor. And then if we can't trace in product units, but we know it's still a product cost and it's down here, then it's overhead. And if we can't trace it to product units and, and we don't, it's not a product cost, then, then it's SGNA. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna rip out this. 
line right here. Okay, nothing, nothing is, is held as if we know for sure it's a period cost. If it has a correlation with a driver we can trace to individual product units, then activities costing says then it's correlated and we can predict costs better by accounting for that correlation. So we're not going to arbitrarily say, no, these are off limits. These are, these are, these are SGNA costs so that we're never going to consider them to be driven by, by activity of our products. In reality, a lot of these, like selling a cost, for example, are indeed driven by, by activity in, in, in your products. <clears throat> so activity-based costing has that advantage. So we're going to, instead of, instead of these, these vertical lines, we get into this, I represented it by these dotted circle lines. We're going to say, all right, well, all the costs that are correlated with a cost driver, cost number five, go into the activity cost pool number five. It'll have a name, not a number, but just since it's an abstract example, I'm going to number them. Same with cost pool over here. Let's say this is our direct labor hours. We have, we know we can, tr we can trace that to individual product units. It's a cost driver that we think we have good reason to believe is associated and correlated with, with overhead cost. And so we're going to take all the overhead costs that are correlated with it and drive them to our product units using that cost driver. We could have machine hours. We can, we can now get kind of fancy. We couldn't get fancy before. Because you had one cost driver. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta hit center mass with this cost driver because otherwise you're, you're, you're just throwing overhead costs willy nilly. And, and you're gonna have really bad estimates. Now we can get a little fancier. And one of the things that you'll see in the, the textbooks about activities costing is they talk about the, the ability to, to go up the, the, uh, hierarchical level of the firm. And so you don't just have volume-based cost drivers like direct labor hours, machine hours, uh, miles driven, things like that. You also can have other ones that are uncorrelated, like, like batches. I have an example that has batches, and I'm, technically I'm kind of cheating. I don't think a department would have batches in, in that direct labor, the, the job order costing, excuse me, the direct job order costing question that I asked. I don't think that's a real company that would have batches. <clears throat> no, you're not, you're unlikely to have most of your overhead costs associated with batches, but once you've accounted for the overhead costs that are associated with direct labor hours and machine hours, you have other ones that are indeed associated with batches. And if you've got as many cost drivers as you want, stick that on there. Increase the accuracy by getting the cost, the, the overhead costs that are, that are driven by batches right here. And it can make a big difference. So one, one area where, where activity based costing tends to outperform non activity based costing is this very academically named non-volume driven overhead or something something like that non-volume driven is the basic idea here so you have let's say you have two products one product is a small candy bar that can be created in these batches of like hundreds or thousands another product is a much larger candy bar and it can only be produced in smaller batches. <clears throat> so a number of your overhead costs, if you have some volume driven cost driver, will be relatively accurately portrayed. But if there are any that are associated with the batches, you're going to end up significantly uh, over or under allocating those costs to the two, the two product lines. It's going to really distort your, your, your view of them. So let's say, for example, these candy bars you're, you're producing. Every batch you produce, you have to clean the oven or clean the materials or it creates wear and tear on, on the, 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 the dishes that, that it's going on, the baking, baking implements. Uh, that's overhead cost and it's associated with batches. So if you have a, a smaller, smaller batch size, you might have a thousand, a thousand big candy bars, but they go in batches of like two or three. Well, that's a ton of batches. They're actually responsible for a lot of that wear and tear that happens when you redo a batch. Whereas the, the, the little candy bars that can go in batches of a hundred or a thousand, you know, they, their, their, their responsibility for batch turnover costs, it's relatively small. But if you haven't, if you don't have a cost driver that's associated with batches or batches isn't a cost driver, like would be, could be in an activity based costing system, all that, information that helps you decide between these two product lines and how much you're going to push one or push the other, which one's most profitable to you, 
it's gone. It's all, it's all messed up in the noise. <clears throat> you don't have it. So that's the argument in, in favor of activity-based costing. All right. The, the kind of $30,000 level here. <clears throat> so let's talk about what we actually do. Cause I've kind of glossed over some of the actual implementation of this and a good number of this, a good amount of this might be, might be plenty, might be plenty review for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll stand by that. Might be review for you. Um, so let's go over an example and I'll kind of fill in the, the gaps of, of things I haven't said yet. So let's say we have three sources of overhead costs. Now, what I'm talking about is we have three general ledger accounts, basically. We have three expense items that we can't, we know they're associated with product production, product associated with product lines, but we can't trace them to individual product units. So they are overhead cost on the general ledger. And that's these three right here. Do, 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 do. The same, same three names right there. <clears throat> You have to make the doot sound when you, when you, when you see them. So you have shop supplies, $50,000. Machine, machine maintenance workers wages. So maintenance wage, wage expense, $120,000. Miscellaneous administrative costs, $85,000. All right. Now what happens, and I kind of glossed over this, to create that Swiss cheese up here, those lovely high paid ABC consultants or something similar, some, some replacement to that, come out and they, <clears throat> They do a study. They do an ABC study for your firm. They try and say, all right, well, you've got these three general ledger categories. And I've made it very, very simple. You'll have probably dozens, more likely, or hundreds, you know, depending on the size of your chart of accounts. But here we got three, because it's a simple example. I want to make it easy. They come out and they say, you know what? You, you have two activities, which each, each activity is going to have its, its, its cost driver associated with it. We, that we can trace these activities to individual product units through a, an activity driver, a, a cost driver. Those two are synonymous. Just let that be. And, and we've decided this is, this is the rate at which each of these overhead costs contributes to these activities. So we, we say you really do two activities. One's machining, one is finishing. And then the leftover is the other, which we really don't think has a, a, a is involved in an activity that we can trace to individual product units. <clears throat> so even with this Swiss cheese up here, I, I call it Swiss cheese, the, the holes are the overhead cost. There's still a remaining Swiss cheese around there, the, the leftover Swiss cheese surrounding it. All this, all this stuff right here and in the middle here, and you know, graphically that's what we're showing is the other category. Things that we we still, even with all the cost drivers we have, it, we don't really think it's associated with individual product units as far as we can trace it. So we're gonna leave that, and that becomes our new SGNA as far as decision making in ABC is concerned. I put that caveat on there because I'm gonna, gonna make sure I drill something home in a second. <clears throat> all right, let's keep going. Uh, all right, so we have two activities, machining and finishing. And they've said, look, your shop supplies, 50% of that, those, those shop supplies costs are consumed by the machining activity. And 35% of your shop supplies are consumed by the finishing activity. 50% of shop supplies are consumed by the other activity. We can't really, we can't really correlate with individual product units. So we're not going to sign responsibility that way. <clears throat> uh, maintenance wages, 90% of it is consumed by the machining activity, only 10% by the finishing activity, 0% by other. Miscellaneous administrative, the bulk of it is down here in other, but there is a component of this miscellaneous administrative expenses that is consumed by the finishing activity and a small fraction that's consumed by machining right here, 5%. So we have to have the percentages equal 100. We're trying to get out this 50,000, trying to figure out the percent of it that goes across these different activities. So we have to fully allocate it. The other catch-all is what allows us to, to kind of make sure we, it kind of saves our, our bacon there. <clears throat> if you were worried about that. Uh, and so then what we can do is we can take Uh, here we go. Sorry. We can take these numbers right here, this 50,000, multiply it by these percentages, and we get these numbers right here. So in fact, let me go in to our, our thing. So this is first stage allocation is what this is called. Example. And see if we can copy it over with relative parsimony. So we have shop supplies, maintenance wages, admin, and we have machining, finishing, and other. 
we have 0 0.5, 0 0.9, 0 0.05, we have 0 0.35, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, we have 0 0.15, we have 0, we have 0.75. Let's just do a little check figure here. Yeah, it's got the right ones. Good. Make sure it's not rounding it off. Good. These are all percents. And now we can take it like this. So I'm, I'm very quickly going through this example here. <clears throat> oh, no, I did it wrong. Usually, I have it set up when I do the problems the other way. It's just my natural inclination is to uh, is to put the GL accounts. What am I doing? Get rid of that percent formatting. It's killing me. Good. <clears throat> Usually, I, I, I default to putting the GL accounts on the left-hand side and the activities over vertically, I guess. But either way works. You just got to transpose it in, in your mind. I'm just copying over the information that we have in the book. There we go. And multiplying. So we need to keep the row absolute. But we're going to let everything else go. The row of this amount right here. And these are not percentages. Dollars. And... We should have recreated the table here. We don't need that. We need this, though. OK, so this recreates our table right here. Oh, I did, I did have it. Ah, oh, this is it. It's, that's why it was off. <clears throat> Except I put this in right here. And we could hide that if we wanted. Uh, so I could multiply it. But we take this 50,000, we multiply it by 50% of it goes to machining, 35% of it goes to finishing, 15% goes to other, and so on and so forth. And we end up with these numbers right here. These are our activity cost pools. And so <clears throat> when we later decide, let's see, machine hours. Oh, here. Looks like the machining activity has machine hours as its cost driver, and the finishing activity has batch starts as its cost driver. But the idea is we're going to have this amount of our overhead cost metered out based on the machine hours consumed by each, each job or order, and this amount of our overhead cost metered out based on batch starts. And this amount as a period cost. No cost driver required because it's, it's, it's other. It's our SGNA. <clears throat> okay, and so then once we have uh, budgeted machine hours, so let's, go, let's go ahead and copy these down. Machining and finishing. So this is activity cost pool. This is budgeted, it's also budgeted, budgeted activity cost pool, budgeted activity driver. The example says we've got a budget, we estimate 5,000 machine hours and 500 batch starts. So we have a rate of $27.45 per machine hour and $93 per batch start. These are our activity rates. So this is I don't know why the comment came all the way over here. This is a PDOH rate for ABC. This is budgeted cost driver for ABC. If I could spell it right. And this is budgeted overhead for ABC. All right, so in case you're looking at the, the in 
case you're looking at these cells later and trying to figure out what they are. This is all based on, we can base all of this, this pattern off of our, our knowledge of job order costing. All right, so the important, the important takeaway here is we have uh, this percentage table which did all the magic for us. It allowed us to take, take general ledger accounts and turn them into ABC magic over here, which is going to get us our rates, and then we can allocate our overhead based on those rates and the, the correlations of responsibility that are associated with that. Now, I said I wanted to say one thing real quick. Uh, I, I, I said things in a certain way on purpose. ABC is not GAAP compliant. GAAP doesn't accept ABC as, as a way of reporting your financial statements. So if you adopt ABC, you are doing that on top of whatever financial reporting system you have. It's an additional thing that you decided is important enough as a decision-making tool that you're going to spend the extra money for this special system or this, this additional way of allocating the overhead costs. So you're tracking two, two ways of, of pricing your, 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 um, your products. Two different ways of figuring out, not pricing, but figuring out the cost of your products. A lot of companies decide, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it. We get so much more information, we can make more profitable decisions, and it pays off the additional cost of having the secondary system. Other firms, either they're in a situation where they really don't have a lot of, for example, non-volume driven overhead costs that would be caught by an ABC system that aren't caught by a job order costing system, or they're just too small because, and they, and so it, it would be prohibitively costly for them to even start this, this, this kind of, or much less maintain an ABC system that they decide it's not worth it. Okay. That should set us up. And I think, I think you could even with, with some additional help from the, the textbook, if you want, All right, I said it's a non-volume related overhead costs. Um, you can, you can start on some 5-1 questions. We'll also talk about that coming Monday. And, and that's it. Thank you. Stop the video.